Hello, my name is Chandler Poling, and today I have the amazing Icelandic composer Atli Orverson on Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Thank you so much for joining me today, Atli. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Atli's latest project, the Apple Limited series Defending Jacob, starring Chris Evans, is now streaming on Apple TV+. He has scored over 40 films and countless TV shows. Up next for Atli is the follow-up film, The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, out in the summer of 2020, and the comedy Eurovision, starring Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. In addition, his debut solo album, You Are Here, will be released later this summer. Now, Atli, you are releasing your first solo album, a reflective and personal album recorded in Iceland. What inspired you to do your first solo album, and can you tell us a bit about what the music, the music that listeners can expect to hear? Uh, yeah, I, uh, what inspired me, um, I think there was a, a, a lot of factors that came together to, to make this actually happen, you know, and I suppose that's the inspiration, you know, there's, there's musical inspiration and then there's the actual inspiration to, to sit down and get it done. And, um, you know, I, I think all composers sort of struggle a little bit with the question, like, who are you as a composer? And like, like, and I, you know, it's like any, any work of art, if you're a painter or a, a novelist, you know, what is the reason to, to create? And the luxury of being a film composer is that that question has been, that problem has been eliminated. You know, we made a movie, we've hired you to make the music, do it, you know? Now, <clears throat> making a, a solo album obviously requires you to, have something to say or or some you know reason to do that and like so many other composers I've sort of had this thing in the back of my mind about doing music for music's sake and, and uh, but that also means you know you have to kind of figure out what do you want to say and uh, and I think uh, that voice has just kind of been getting louder and louder inside of me and then I moved back home to Iceland a few years ago, and um, something about being here, you know, the name of the album is You Are Here, and I am here, and I, I'm, I'm home, back home. Something about right. that has right. been very inspiring and, uh, and introspective, to be honest, because, you know, it, it's weird to move back to your childhood home when you're, when you're grown up, and it, to be honest, it's like, I never ever thought I would move back here. So, so there's been all kinds of kind of like feelings and, and like sort of just, I think it stirred up some stuff inside of me that, that wanted to come out as well. So, you know, and I don't know, almost everybody knows that Iceland is really beautiful. So it's in, the nature is really inspiring here. Um, and, you know, I guess the final sort of, you know, missing element was just the commitment to sit down and, and do it. And, uh, and I realized at some point, you know, we always think, you know, when I find time to do it, I'll do it. And I realized, you know, that just isn't going to happen until I take the time to do it. And um, in the end, you know, I, I committed to it and, and so far have been able to hold my end of the bargain because we're almost done. I just, I'm just mastering the last few tracks. Awesome. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you, the Iceland is beautiful. So I'm just curious, does the environment impact your creativity? Uh, you split your time between LA and Iceland. So LA being very busy, you know, more tropical kind of city and Iceland being a more sparse kind of beautiful country. So uh, does the environment ever impact your writing? Oh yeah, it definitely does. And I don't think I really maybe realized that until I did move back here. Uh, what I have noticed through the years, you know, when I was still living full time in LA, I mean, I sort of spent my time back and forth, as you mentioned, but I, you know, I, when I lived in LA full time and I'd just come back home for maybe Christmas or summer vacations or something, I would always have these really vivid dreams and they were usually, I would like dream about music. And of course, in the morning when I woke up, I couldn't remember what it was, but, um, there's always been something about just physically being here that's really kind of stirred up a lot of creativity. And 
on top of that, I, for me, you know, I often talk about when you live in a big city, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of physical noise, but I think there's a lot of psychological noise, you know, that you just kind of, there's just so much energy and you're thinking about all these things you have to do and you've just been in traffic and you've seen a million people and there's just like all this stuff in your head. Whereas where I live, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, a traffic jam is like four cars, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, the, it's just, the, when I look out my window, there's just like these long, clean lines of next to nothing. And it's very, very beautiful. And yeah, I, for sure, there's a kind of a, a peaceful mindfulness that comes with that, that I find to be very sort of conducive to, to being creative. Awesome. Well, I've been to Iceland, so I know how amazing it is there as well. <laughs> right? I can't wait to go back. Now, yeah. what I find fascinating is that the Defending Jacob director, Mortem Tildum, and the writer, Mark Bumbach, listened to early tracks of your album and decided that you'd be a great fit for their show. Can you tell us more about this and about the collaboration and creative, creative process with the showrunner and writer? Yeah. No, yeah, it, it was really amazing to be honest i mean you know i didn't even know about this but my agent had sent out um two or three tracks from my album um i mean i knew he had them and he was going to send them to people and then all of a sudden he's like you know i i sent these out to to these guys who are doing the show and they really love it and I want you to look at their film and and um and or i mean at their show and there was something about you know obviously I watched the first three episodes and I was completely hooked. And I realized a few things. One, Morton Tildum, who's the director, I actually know him from years back because our sons were classmates at this preschool in LA. So I, oh, wow. I knew Morton kind of socially before any of this happened. He's Norwegian, I'm Icelandic. And you know, one of the things that stood out for me watching the first episodes was that it, it had this sort of tone of this Nordic noir kind of Scandinavian feel to it. And um, so I, I feel like there's probably something in that that just worked right off the bat, you know, sort of like this, you know, I don't know. I mean, I truly believe that geography and, and what, you, what you grow up with, your aesthetics come from that. So I, I think that was a perfect match instantly. And, and um, you know, it's the kind of music that Mark Bombach also listens to in his free time is sort of this, you know, minimalistic, um, neoclassical, for lack of better terms, kind of music. So, yeah, I, I guess it was just meant to be or something because, you know, I, I walked into that situation, the music was a perfect fit, and and um, the, the whole creative process really was just curiously, um, I, I, I wouldn't say easy, it's never easy, but it was like, it just felt good. It felt right. You know, we would sort of come to the same conclusions. And, and, and when I came up with a, you know, a solution for one, like needing a theme or a new sound or something for a new character, we always just, there wasn't ever any real sort of disagreement. We, we just, it was a match, you know, and, and it, it's a great thing when you find these things in a collaborative medium like film and television. Yeah, absolutely. And the series, it's not only a crime series, but also this psychological family drama. And I wanted to know, do you, what do you find interesting writing for dark emotional drama? Is there anything about the music or themes you're able to create that differ from other genres? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm probably just a dark emotional person, you know, because I really, <laughs> I really enjoy writing that music. Uh, and I mean, I think there is actually some truth to that, even though I joke about it. I mean, um, I don't know. There, I, we, uh, once again, you know, I come back to sort of geography, to Iceland and growing up in really long, dark winters. And um, there's just, you know, it, 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 it's, in, it's in my DNA, I suppose, in a way. But, you know, in general, I find that um, it's like my album. I wanted to write music that I would want to listen to. And I feel like this show is the kind of show that I'd want to watch because it's, it's, you know, I, I think the, the, it's a really well-crafted, really well-written series. And it's obviously one of those, uh, 
crime drama. So, you know, the, the crime and the, and the thriller aspect of it is important. But for me, the most interesting thing about the show is the exploration of characters. Absolutely. Well, I have just a, a random kind of technical question that I'm curious about. When you're working on a series that kind of builds up to like an explosive finale or reveal, uh, do you map out the music for the entire season or are you going episode by episode? Well, um, this being an eight episode miniseries, um, I did actually sort of try to map it out as, as good as I could. Uh, you know, because I actually believe that if you if you binge watch this show, that there's the arc of it and the structure is like a really, really long movie. You know, it, it's sort of, it is basically three acts spread out over eight episodes. And um, so, yeah, it was actually important to think about that. And I mean, all along, you know, from the very, from the very first conversation I had with Mark and, and uh, Morton, um, we talked about the importance of episode eight. You know, that, that was always sort of the, you know, the, the goal, the end, the, the finish line and, and, you know, what we needed to do to get to that point. Um, having said that, I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, surprises that came along the way, you know, sort of, at, you know, like problems that I had to solve, you know, and I, I, like all the episodes would sort of surprise me in one way or another, you know, I didn't realize I was going to need to write music like, you know, well, I, I don't want to give anything away, but you know, like, like there was all, there would always be some little sort of puzzle that had to be solved for each episode. Well, I can't wait to reach the end of this series. Like I said, I only saw the first three episodes that were released last week, and, and I think it's outstanding. Um, my next question for you is, Iceland, it's a rather small country, but has so many amazing composers. Hilda Gudnadottir, the late Johan Johansson, Erdis Stefansdottir, Falgir Sigurdsson, and Oliver Arnolds, who does the main theme on this show, and yourself, of course. Like, do you feel that there is a music community in Iceland that supports each other and lifts each other up? Absolutely. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't really a part of that community for the longest time because I, you know, I was pretty young when I moved to LA and grew up in that community, sort of the film scoring community there, which is also another really supportive, beautiful community. Uh, but I have learned, you know, after moving back and, and I mean, I, I kept in touch with people and, you know, all of that, but I've really seen how, what a, what an amazingly supportive community it is in Iceland. And, you know, I, I've actually kind of been struck by it, by, by how open people are working with each other, supporting each other, helping each other. And, uh, you know, I don't know, there's just something really special going on with Icelandic music. I agree, I agree. <laughs> now, for something completely different, the Eurovision Song Contest. It's gaining more and more popularity in the United States, and I'm well familiar with it because my partner Thomas listens to Eurovision songs uh, quite a lot. And so I'm a little bit familiar with Eurovision Song Contest overall, and you're scoring the film adaptation starring Will Ferrell that's coming to Netflix this summer. How is it to work on such a fun project that obviously is so different from Defending Jacob? Well, it, it was sort of the perfect antidote to, to, to do in Defending Jacob, coming out of this sort of really dark, introspective drama to this just extrovert, hilariously funny thing, you know? And, and uh, I mean, I, I love that, love the film. Obviously been a huge fan of Will Ferrell's forever. And, um, so it was a, just another really sort of great surprise that just popped up. I was actually getting close to finishing Defending Jacob when I first got asked to do it. And I was just like, what? And, you know, cause you're in that sort of headspace and, you know, and like, how would you like to do this comedy? And, and uh, it, it connects with my life on so many levels because like you said, I mean, us Europeans, like, like you're, like Thomas did, you know, I grew up with this sort of watching this once a year and it was a big deal. And, and I, I think actually Icelanders, we, we tend to sort of pride ourselves of doing things, taking things farther than anybody per capita. And I, I think actually there's no country in the world 
that has as many Eurovision viewers per capita as Iceland. So there's just, I don't know, it, it's been around as long as I can remember. And, you know, my half brother, uh, actually two of my brothers have gone to compete for Iceland on behalf of Ooh, Iceland in that's Eurovision. Awesome. That's yeah. amazing. And, you know, it is, it's hilarious. And, and then, you know, the movie was largely shot in a town called Husavik, which is the next big town from where I live in Akureyri. So, and that was a part of the reason to be honest that I was kind of brought on to this was, you know, I think it, it sort of perked the director's interest that, you know, there was an Icelandic composer who would be a candidate. And then he heard a, a theme that I'd written for uh, The Edge of Seventeen, uh, which was this lovely teenage drama that I did a, a, a few, or dramedy that I did a few years ago. And he was like, all right, this guy's from Iceland. I like this music, it's perfect for what I'm doing. So it was another one of those, like, you know, you just kind of somehow fit into the project, you know, and, and uh, I'm literally, I like delivered the last cue yesterday. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I just finished and it's been an absolute joy. I love the film. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Um, the Defending Jacob soundtrack is now available. Otley's album, You Are Here, will come out this summer. And the first track, Whom, part one, is now available on Spotify and you can watch the music video on YouTube. So hello from LA to Iceland. Thank you so much again, Otley. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. <laughs>